once again, welcome everyone. I'm glad we've got so many people that are uh, taking a, an evening out here to come and join us and learn about Traditional Arts Indiana's apprenticeship program. Uh, I'm John Kay, I'm the Director of Traditional Arts Indiana. I've been doing that for uh, the past 16 years. I've worked as a, as a folklorist for probably closer to 25 years uh, at this point. Uh, and one of the kind of proven models that we have uh, for the work that we do uh, is apprenticeships. And so I know that several people are joining us who are artists, and that's great. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we can try to answer any questions you have. We also have arts administrators that are joining us as well, uh, and community leaders that are joining us as well. I think the main thing I wanted to do with this program is really get word out about Traditional Arts Indiana's apprenticeship program. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better way than to try to uh, do a webinar like this. So thank you to Anna for facilitating this uh, for me. Anyway, um, I wanna tell you just a little bit about Traditional Arts Indiana first. Traditional Arts Indiana is a statewide folk arts program. Uh, we're, um, uh, we're, uh, we're a statewide folk arts program, and we're a partnership between Indiana University. So we're based at Bloomington. We're a part of the Cook Center uh, for Public Arts and Humanities down at IU. Uh, and we're a partnership between IU and the Indiana Arts Commission. So we've been, from the inception of the program, we have been a part uh, of uh, both the IU and the Arts Commission. In 2007, we were recognized as the state's official statewide service organization for Indiana's folk and traditional arts. Uh, we have received a really nice state resolution recognizing the work that we've done and kind of empowering us to, to continue to try to serve the state uh, through various programs that I'll talk about. We receive our support from Indiana University, of course, but we also get uh, funds from the Indiana Arts Commission, as well as funds that come directly from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, every year we get funding for the folk and traditional arts from the NEA and the Indiana Arts Commission, and that's always uh, uh, important to us. And our program exists to identify, document, and support the folk and traditional arts of Indiana. I should say from the outset, these are traditions that have been here a long time, and these are also traditions that are brought uh, to Indiana uh, today. So we're working with both uh, people like the, the, uh, the Miami uh, tribe of uh, Oklahoma that our uh, ancestral homelands are here in Indiana. We work with them, uh, with artists uh, from that community. Uh, but we also work with uh, immigrant traditions that are brought here today. So we're, we're dealing with the whole spectrum of the folk and traditional arts. Uh, so what am I saying when I say uh, traditional arts or folk arts? That means something different to a lot of different people. Uh, and for, because we receive our funding from the National Endowment for the Arts for this program, uh, specifically for this program, we use the NEA's definition of folk and traditional arts. And this is how they define it. The folk and traditional arts are rooted in and reflective of the cultural life of a community. Community members may share a common ethnic heritage, uh, cultural mores, language, religion, occupation, or geographic region. These vital and constantly reinvigorated artistic traditions are shaped by values and standards of excellence that are passed from generation to generation, most often within families and communities through demonstration, conversation, and practice. So when we talk about folk and traditional arts, it's those two things. We're talking about arts that are practiced within specific communities or groups, uh, but also that that have a type of genealogy to them. Things that have been passed down uh, from one generation to the next or from one musician to the next or one artisan to the next. Uh, it's something that is learned uh, usually informally uh, through demonstration or conversation or practice as the NEA's definition says. Uh, and so these are the very specific types of art forms 
that Traditional Arts Indiana seeks to work with and support in the state. Uh, we value all creative practice in people's lives, and we, we think that that's an important, uh, a important thing for folks to continue to foster and cultivate uh, in their lives. Uh, but our charge, and what makes us really unique in the state of Indiana, is the fact that we serve the folk and traditional arts. Now, I hope that you're, those of you that say, wait a second, that's not what I do. I hope that you're not tuning out because what I think a lot of you will find is when we start talking about some of these artistic traditions, you'll either say, oh yeah, I do do something like that. Or you may say, oh, my neighbor does something like that. I should tell them about this program or my uncle or my aunt or my parents or my niece or nephew or whoever. Uh, I think you're going to find uh, that these are the type of arts that are parts of everyday life. Um, a little bit more about traditional arts in Vienna before I get into the apprenticeship program directly. Uh, we have key programs that we offer. And so if this program ends up not being uh, something that's of interest to you, there might be something else that we offer that, that, that is uh, more, to your, uh, more to your needs. Uh, first of all, we do field work. We work all around the state uh, to document Indiana's traditional arts. We conduct oral history type interviews with people, but specifically about arts and crafts and music traditions that are found within community life. Uh, and so we do that. We usually uh, have a separate grant that we go to the National Endowment for the Arts to do that type of field work. Uh, those of you that have seen our work, you maybe uh, have seen us uh, more, more than likely through our traveling exhibit program. We're in 30 libraries around the state. We travel uh, uh, several of these traveling exhibits. Uh, at any one time, we have 30 traveling exhibits out around the state featuring the work of traditional artists. Uh, we also have a uh, Heritage Fellowship, which is a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for folk and traditional arts. It kind of honors uh, the work that they've done. Uh, we're in entering our third year of doing that. The deadline for that will be uh, in November. And then finally, uh, another major program that we have, and probably our, uh, the one that I'm most excited about these days, is our apprenticeship program. Uh, which basically facilitates and funds apprenticeships, uh, master artists basically, to ensure that traditional knowledge passes on to the next generation. So what are we talking about when we talk about uh, apprenticeships? And I could give you all types of definitions. I'm a professor at Indiana University and you know how we can be. I could, I could wax on about the ins and outs of traditional knowledge and apprenticeships and what a folk artist is, but I, I like to tell people the stories of some of the artists that we've worked with through this program. Uh, so like Jason Nickel, uh, blacksmith worked with Jack Brubaker uh, uh, in Brown County, Indiana. Jack kind of established the aesthetic style of what ironwork would be like in, in that community. Uh, and um, he took on an apprentice, uh, uh, Paolo here, and as well as Jason's daughter joined in, uh, Iris, and uh, they're, uh, they basically ended up making this beautiful gate uh, for the community orchard through their work. So you can see it's both rooted in time, three generations, you might say, but it also the work that they were doing was very localized. It wasn't just, oh, Blacksmithing is a folk art. Uh, it has to be something that's rooted in community. Blacksmithing is folk art, but you have to tell us about that community and about that group. Uh, we've worked with Tony Artists, probably some of you in the Indianapolis uh, know Tony and his son Andre here. Uh, Andre is an amazing uh, drummer, so is, uh, is Tony. Uh, but apprentice uh, to make sure that he knew how to not just play the drums but to build the drums uh, that they were playing and so there was this uh, this tradition uh, of african-american drum making that passed on uh, between them uh, there's jim smoke down in washington county in the southern part of the state uh, jim played with bill monroe he uh, 
grew up playing old time banjo and bluegrass banjo. Uh, and he, he took on an apprentice to teach his claw hammer and, and uh, three finger style of, uh, of banjo playing uh, to ensure that it, it uh, passed on to the next generation. Uh, there's Amelia Culfer, uh, African-American uh, quilt maker uh, from up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, been basically a seamstress since she was six years old, making uh, just beautiful quilts. Uh, and she, uh, she worked with her, her niece, uh, Andrea Faust, uh, to basically, not to teach her how to sew, not even necessarily to teach her how to quilt. Uh, but to deepen her knowledge in quilt making. So it was passing on that traditional knowledge, but Andrea was already participating in it. That's another important aspect, and we'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. Uh, Robin probably knows Scott Shoemaker in Indianapolis, a member of the Miami tribe. Uh, Scott is a, a ribbon work artist, uh, and he took on his daughter, Hazel, uh, to do uh, some beautiful ribbon work and to pass that knowledge on to her. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the relationship that they had was when they would get together to do their apprenticeship program, uh, they would only speak in Miami uh, so that they were kind of revitalizing not just the craft of doing this, but actually the knowledge and the language uh, that, uh, that uh, passed uh, that way. So she was picking up all of that. Uh, and she ended up going out to Oklahoma to a tribal uh, celebration and uh, uh, ended up winning for her age group uh, uh, with the piece that she made uh, for her apprenticeship program. We've worked with uh, Deborah Bolaños uh, up in East Chicago, Indiana, uh, a ballet folklorico instructor. Uh, she uh, actually ended up with three apprentices uh, we find with dance, often teaching one person is difficult, teaching three uh, is, uh, is better. And, and here's uh, an important lesson from this. Uh, Deborah's an amazing uh, uh, instructor. Uh, and East Chicago has had ballet folklorico there since the 1970s. There's been this vibrant uh, Mexican-American community in East Chicago, Indiana, that goes back to, I don't know, the 20s or the 30s, uh, a long established community group there. And so we were really thrilled when she, uh, she agreed to be a part of this. But she teaches dozens of students. Uh, and the apprenticeship program is not about, oh, how can I supplement my students' income? How, how can I uh, get some lessons for my students for free? That's not what this program's about. When you take on an apprentice, it's really about taking on someone that you're going to try to deepen your relationship with them, that you're going to take them to the next level, that they're going to, uh, you believe, may be that master artist in the future, that you're kind of bringing that person up. Uh, so it's not just a supplement. She wasn't just gonna say, oh, here's three more students that I could teach, uh, I could get a supplement for their income. Uh, she's actually one of her daughters was one of the three uh, women that participated and it became very much about training that next generation of people who could teach within their community. Uh, and I found that to be really, uh, really exceptional. Uh, this is Larry Haycraft um, uh, and his son uh, Samuel. When I first met Larry, probably about 10 years ago or so, uh, he was the last in a line of hoop net makers uh, for commercial fishing down on the Wabash River in, uh, in uh, Pike County. And uh, he was uh, the fourth generation of people in his family to make this very distinctive old style of net for fishing in these, these waters. Uh, Samuel ha wasn't interested in hoop nets at first. But then over time, uh, through Traditional Arts Indiana doing demonstrations and programs with Larry Samuel kind of came around to it. Uh, and before long, he was making his own hoop nets. Uh, but it's not just one type of net. Uh, they're all different patterns. And so when Larry took him on, he was already making nets, uh, but he taught him a whole repertoire of net building. Uh, 
to to kind of continue that. Uh, in fact, the an oval hoop net, which is considered by many to be the most complicated style of net, uh, Samuel made one of those, probably the first one that had been built in the state of Indiana in almost 30 years, perhaps only the second or third this century to have actually been built. Uh, so really pretty, pretty amazing uh, that that, uh, uh, that that had happened. Uh, and we were really thankful to be a part of facilitating that. As we, uh, as we said, we had uh, Deborah Bolaños doing this. Uh, and here they did a community celebration as a showcase of their talents. Um, so here's what the deal is. You can see Vicki there with, uh, with her uh, apprentice, Susan Harder, uh, doing beautiful willow work. I always try to include Vicki in all my programs. Um, but uh, the apprenticeship, how this works. The master artist finds their own apprenticeship. Every year I get people, people that call, oh, my son or my daughter, they're interested in this. Can you help us find an apprentice? Well, we might be, or a master artist, we might be able to do that, but usually it's best when the master artist kind of picks the person that they want to work with uh, and to take them to that next, uh, to that next level. Uh, we basically will fund up to a year, uh, year long support for an apprenticeship. Uh, which is, comes to the master artist, receives a $3,000 honorarium uh, for being a part of that. Uh, that $3,000 is for them. It's their payment for taking on this student. This program, there are programs like this all over the United States and they're designed in a whole variety of ways. Uh, and one of the things that I quickly saw that was happening in other states was the master artist was often spending almost all their money uh, to fund stuff for their apprentices. And I didn't want that to happen. Uh, so we also added into that, the apprentice can receive up to $1,000 of additional support for supplies, tools, travel, that sort of thing. They just have to basically tell us what they're going to spend that money for uh, and, and show, us, uh, show us that. Uh, so it's for up to $4,000, $3,000 to the master artist, $1,000 that goes to the master artist, but, but passes on to the, uh, uh, to the apprentice to help with materials. Uh, and the deadline, August 3rd this year, we pushed off the application uh, just a little bit longer. And I'm around to help people uh, with their application if they have any uh, questions or anything that they want to, to work with us on. I'm happy to review people's applications to help them uh, make their applications better. Uh, so we're here to help. Here's some common mistakes uh, that end up happening. Uh, one is someone applies for something uh, and it's not a folk or traditional art. Now let me, let me nest that. It's not that we're necessarily saying, oh, this is not a folk or traditional art. It is incumbent upon you to tell us why your art form is a folk and traditional art. Uh, just to say, oh, I make baskets. Baskets is a folk art. It's not, you know, it's not obvious to us uh, because remember those two things. It has to exist over time and it has to be within a community or group. So those are, we're gonna ask you some questions in the application form uh, to try to get you to tell us about those aspects of it. So make sure you make the case for why your music or your craft or your dance should be considered a traditional art, okay? Uh, and I, we funded things that when I first heard about it, I thought, no, that's not a folk art. And then I read their explanation and said, oh, of course that's a folk art. You know, and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, Second common mistake that happens. Apprentice has not demonstrated interest in the tradition or experience in the tradition. Now, your apprentice doesn't have to be a master artist or skilled uh, necessarily, but they need to have at least started it, that they've tried it out. There's nothing worse than to get an application from somebody 
Uh, we had someone last year, the, the artist was incredible. I would have loved to have funded uh, this apprenticeship, but the person that they chose to have as their apprentice had never once tried uh, the art form. Uh, and so it just didn't seem like a practical thing for us to do to, to take one of our six spots and invest into someone who's never even bothered to, to see if they like doing what they're wanting to apprentice. So the apprentice should have some type of history or trajectory or, or investment in, uh, in, uh, in that art form. The, the third is picking an apprentice who's not a member of the community to which the creative practice uh, is a part. Okay, so I, I've worked with some traditional artists that grew up, maybe it might be in an immigrant tradition, uh, and that is the music that is part of that community. Uh, but then there's like a local artist that's decided that they're interested in that art form, and they just wanna learn that art without necessarily becoming part of that community. So since this is, we're looking at arts that are rooted in community, we really wanna make sure that we're focused on traditional arts um, and artists that are gonna kind of be there to support community life. This is really, it's a, for entering into a partnership. These are really not so much grants, but they're partnerships where Traditional Arts Indiana is investing in a master artist and an apprentice but the idea that we can actually improve or cultivate uh, community life. And it's kind of, we're helping individuals, uh, but as a tool for supporting that community. So if you're picking someone from outside that community, it doesn't, uh, it won't necessarily support them. It just supports the individual. So that's, that's how we think about it, at least. Uh, so those are three common, uh, common mistakes. Uh, so if you know someone that we should uh, contact or you want to know more, here's some contact information for us. Uh, we're in this, uh, we're getting ready right now. We're COVID-19, we're not there right now. But uh, in the fall, we'll be moving back into uh, the Cook Center for Public Arts and Humanities on IU's campus. So uh, come see us uh, if you're there. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you so much, John. That was incredibly, even for, even for me, um, that was incredibly informative. Um, it's a good refresher to remind ourselves of what arts role, the art, the role of the arts is in, in our lives or what it could be and where it shows up where we didn't even realize it before. Um, if you have questions, feel free. Actually, the best thing to do is um, throw it in the chat box and um, I'll be watching. So John will answer questions as they come in and, and I'll be watching for other questions. If you're on Facebook Live, feel free to, to throw a comment in the comments and we'll make sure it's answered here on Zoom. So you can also just wave your hands if that's uh, helpful for you. Can you remind us the application deadline, John? It's August 1st, or I think it's the 3rd. It's, it's at, uh, it's on my slides. It's August 3rd. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a month later than what it has been in the past because we wanted to make sure people had plenty of time uh, to apply. And yeah. um, Go ahead. when does the apprenticeship begin, quote unquote? Uh, traditionally, we start the apprenticeship in October. Uh, because it takes us a little bit of time uh, to actually adjudicate the, uh, the uh, applications. We try to turn them around in a month, uh, and then we, uh, we uh, let people know, usually by the end of the next month, uh, September, uh, so they could actually start things in October. We may not have money uh, to the artist, for another month after that, because we're always waiting upon uh, paperwork and contracts and that sort of thing to, to come back, uh, but uh, usually October. And can you explain a little bit more about what um, or who is considered a, a master artist? Uh, we don't necessarily define that. We let communities define that. Uh, it's been my experience that if I go into a community and I go, 
oh, that's just so beautiful. Uh, the next person's going to come along behind me, you know, and say, oh, can't you hear that? The, the, the strings are buzzing there. You didn't hear that part? Oh, I thought that was the cool part, you know? And so we really try to, to look for examples of how the community, and we have questions about this, how the community has recognized that master artist themselves. Uh, now, having said that, I've been doing this work for about 16 years, so I've got a, a relatively uh, deep uh, experience throughout the, the state and, and, and on folk and traditional arts. And so I, I can usually try to figure out what I should be looking for and listening for. Uh, but traditional arts Indiana doesn't, uh, I don't rank or evaluate the applications. I facilitate the review of them. We end up looking at the applications and then we try to find uh, folklorists and artists and community members that can help us adjudicate. We usually have three or four uh, external reviewers that come together and they read all of the applications and they share their views on it. So I'm just there to facilitate and answer questions and uh, to kind of flag things that might uh, present a problem that maybe people might not recognize. And, and strings that people may not recognize. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. How to make their case even stronger, right? Exactly. Um, do you know of anyone in South Bend who's participated in this program? Uh, not recently. Uh, this program uh, has had two earlier iterations of it. Uh, there was a Irish musician back in the 80s. He just passed away, and I'm not going to be able to pull his name out of my, uh, my head, but John, I'm sure you know who that was. Uh, real uh, David James, yes. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, I think he received one back in the 1980s when Betty Belenus uh, was actually uh, over the program. Uh, so Irish Museum, uh, Irish music rather, in South Bend is uh, is really huge. So I, I recognize the importance of that uh, that community tradition. Very cool. Um, Grace, did you have a question? Were you trying to get attention? You'll have to unmute yourself if you'd like to speak. Okay, um, so about the apprentice, uh, it should be a person to person. It means it could be a group like uh, teachers in elementary school, something like that. Um, I would say if you're looking at it to be, it could be a, a teacher, but if you're looking at it to be like an in-service type of training or, uh, or that, you would have to make a point of them being part of of a community mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and sharing uh, sharing that there. Having said that, you know, it probably that probably wouldn't be the best way to approach this program. Yeah, uh, so but I would be happy to talk work with you one on one to kind of figure oh, out yeah, yeah. what what uh, what that might best be. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it might be something. The other thing that I'm fairly experienced at doing is saying, oh, it's not this, but let's, uh, let's see if we can fund it uh, this way and we can do a cool project on uh, about this or that. Uh, so I'm happy to, uh, uh, to share my information uh, with you and we can, we can talk about your application directly. Oh yeah, I contact you soon. I would welcome that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> John, how do you determine if a proposed master artist is in fact member of uh, a member of a particular skill community? Uh, we, uh, we ask for letters of support from the community to, to which they say that they're a member. Uh, there are a few examples where it is, uh, uh, it is uh, incumbent upon them to, to be forthright uh, uh, about uh, their membership. Uh, I think American uh, traditional arts is the fact that we don't fund uh, Native American arts for people who are not members of federally recognized Native American uh, tribes, except for 
Uh, last year, we funded a non-Native American artist to, to teach a group of Native American artists. And what we asked uh, for that application is they had to get a letter from the tribe uh, saying that they wanted that artist to teach that traditional art to their community. Uh, and so once that community said, uh, said, yes, this person has traditional knowledge that they've amassed over so, so many years that we think would be valuable in our community. Uh, we wanna make sure that it, it continues on and becomes revitalized uh, in our community. Uh, then we will fund it. So we kind of put it back upon the community to, to kind of tell us, how do you want to do this? It's really more and more about supporting community life through this funding of individual artists and their apprenticeships. So uh, that becomes incumbent upon the artist to make their case. And to, we also have work samples that we want to see. And we will look at those things or audio samples that we listen to. Uh, but we also are asking for members from the community to tell us uh, uh, about the process. Thank you. And have we been able to track the work and growth of apprentices in the years following their participation in this program? I know you often have very good relationships with those folks, but other, beyond that, what's that like? Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is in a variety of ways. We do, we do a few things. Um, through the year that they're funded, we do site visits. And so we don't, it's not just, like I said, this is not a grant, it's a partnership. And so we end up going uh, and we sit down with them uh, a few times and we do an interview with them uh, about uh, their art form, but then also about their apprenticeship uh, and how it worked, what worked, what didn't work, what's happening, how can we facilitate. Uh, and we're getting, hopefully we're getting better about doing that. We're trying to build in more resources associated with that. Uh, then a year, nine months, following the apprenticeship cycle, uh, we found that most people very rarely truly totally finish uh, in the full year, first year, uh, but we'll do a big celebration of those artists uh, like eight, nine months out. And we invite them back to, uh, back to campus and we do a program with them. We will also do a program in their home community if they wanna do that. Uh, and we kind of recognize them when we do this type of showcase uh, for them. There have been uh, several uh, wonderful success stories uh, that we've seen uh, that have included things like, uh, I mentioned the blacksmith they just installed uh, last month, a uh, beautiful gate at the community orchard all made out of this beautiful iron work. Uh, there's been, uh, uh, People like Danny Tipman, a member of the Miami tribe, who uh, is teaching traditional plant use to her daughter. Uh, and uh, they've been harvesting wild rice for probably the first time in 200 years. Uh, you know, just pretty uh, amazing stuff where the apprenticeship that we funded for them actually becomes something that's an investment in that community. And so those are the types of things that we're hearing back. Uh, when, we, when we do it right, it's really, we're funding these individuals, but it's really more about funding a community of practice. You kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, maybe you can provide some more detail. How, how do you really uh, determine if, a, if an apprentice applicant has the, the right level of skill or experience um, in the craft that they're really applying to partner with the, with, the, with the master artist on? Or is there even kind of a consideration of existing skill in that? I, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily, uh, um, I don't think that there's necessarily a level, uh, but there is a commitment that we're looking for. Uh, you know, that there's definitely, someone's got to show that, you know, that they're going to be there, you know, saying you're gonna spend a year with someone practicing and doing this, we wanna make sure that there's, um, uh, there's, there's a commitment there. I know that, uh, uh, I, could, I don't think Scott would mind me saying this, Scott Shoemaker, his daughter Hazel, 
um, I had a lot of caveats and I told him this about him. His daughter is like eight years old. And I was like, that's too young for an apprentice. How, how can there be uh, this type of, I, I, I just wasn't sure it was a good, uh, a good investment for us. Uh, but she uh, has done just beautiful work. Her, her, her uh, studiousness in the thing, I mean, it really became a success story. And like I told him, uh, that became less about her necessarily growing up to be a, bead, uh, a uh, ribbon work artist, but more about him passing on traditional knowledge and traditional culture and a sense of community pride and community identity uh, to her. Uh, and so that's what we ended up uh, funding. Uh, and we see that as an investment also in community life. That's great, thank you. And um, has there been any Amish or Mennonite participation in this program? Uh, Vicki, who's left us, so she's probably hanging out over in Facebook land, I, if I know Vicki. Uh, uh, she, uh, she's Mennonite. Uh, we've not had any Old Order Mennonite or, or, or Old Order Amish. Uh, I would welcome it. Um, uh, but we have not yet. Uh, I've, I've told several people uh, about it. Uh, but no. I think that's part of the beauty of this program is that um, the better, like the more successful it is, the more questions come about of it, right? Like, well, is this art? And don't we love all love that question? Anyone who is involved in the arts in any way, loves that question. I say about tongue in cheek, but you you've done or and it's not so much even about art, but this is this is this is a tradition of our community, and those are exactly the right kinds of questions that we should be asking ourselves in, in the arts and culture right. field. I mean, I have a I have a PhD in folklore. I mean, that's pretty uh, esoteric. But one of the things that that gives me is I see art everywhere I go. Uh, Treeing Walker Coonhounds from up in. Uh, uh, Anderson, uh, Indiana, uh, to uh, a well-made barn, uh, to old-time fiddling, wh whatever, whatever the art form is, uh, I can appreciate uh, the, it as a traditional art. Uh, even the things my friend uh, Danny Kane, who's a, another hoop net maker, who's also been a master artist in the apprenticeship program, he kept he keeps saying. Well, John keeps telling me an artist. I'm not an artist. But John keeps telling me I am. That's right. All right. So let's hit the high points again, John. Um, deadline for this application is August. August 3rd. Uh, make sure that you get your application in. You can uh, send it to us by mail. You can email it to us. Uh, I try to keep it as simple as possible. I'm happy to, to work with any of you on, uh, on uh, how to apply or if you have any problems with, uh, with the, your work samples or anything like that. Uh, I am, uh, yeah, thank you for pulling that up, Anna. Uh, you can find out all the information on our website. Uh, you just go to uh, tradarts.indiana.edu uh, or traditionalarts.indiana.edu. That'll get you there. Um, and uh, go down to the bottom. You can see examples of uh, previous recipients uh, our, through our booklets, our current recipients, our past recipients, and uh, uh, also the application form as both a Word document, if that's useful for you, or a PDF. Okay. Again, $3,000. Um, uh, the thing that most people are going to have to uh, it takes a little bit of leg room for you or, or lead time for you is the fact that you're going to need to make sure that you get your letters of support and you want to make sure you get those from the right people, uh, not just your cousin, uh, but actually someone that represents that community, which could be your cousin, uh, but they have to be significant uh, uh, to that art form. Uh, you also need to have work samples. You know, that might mean that you, you know, Take some some new pictures of the work that you're working on and your uh, to to do that or make a, a recording or something. Uh, so those are the two things: letters of support, work samples that slow people down. 
Uh, if you have problems with the narrative part, uh, if English is not your, uh, your first language, we're always willing to work with people on uh, uh, just kind of dictating to us uh, what they want to say in the narrative, and we're happy to help uh, in that. We're not, uh, it's another reason why we say this is not a grant application where we're adjudicating the application. It's really more about uh, trying to find the best applicants, the best pairs to work together to make this happen. Fabulous. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. You can see I've pasted a link to that program webpage in the chat. And again, you can reach John at tradarts at indiana.edu. We will Traditional definitely arts follow. Traditionalarts.indiana.edu. I said it wrong before. That's the yeah. website, right. And yes. if you want to email John um, and get in touch about um, help with an application, um, I post pasted an email address in the chat as well. We'll send you an email with the address that you um, registered for this webinar, send you some the slides and recording to this if you um, want to go back to it. So thank you all. Have a great evening um, and stay creative. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you to the Indiana Arts Commission for making this happen. I really appreciate it. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you, John.